Hey guys, welcome to a very interesting video. Before I get into that though, I just want to say that I hope you're having a fantastic day. Now, the reason I did this video, the reason I interviewed Shadowborn Games and their for their Oathsworn Kickstarter uh, campaign is because I'm really interested in industry stuff. I'm really interested in what it takes to run a Kickstarter, what it is on that side of the fence, how they see things, what they're looking at. And also, I wanted to have an opportunity to kind of ask the questions you might be asking. I ask stuff like, does Oathsworn have a legit ending? I ask, are they going to follow up with a whole bunch more Oathsworn stuff? There's a lot of information in here that I think might be of interest to you. And if nothing else, it was just a great excuse to chat with Jamie and Toby over at Shadowborn Games. They are a great bunch. Now, before I get into that, uh, just FYI, I'm focusing just on them right now. And so it'll, you'll just see kind of them uh, from like a webcam view as they kind of talk and then I'll... I'll be discussing with them. Uh, additionally, just real quick, this has nothing to do with the video per se, but a lot of people have been interested in the shirts I've been wearing recently, uh, commenting on those. I found a really cool, really nerdy website that I started buying way too many shirts from, and I actually contacted them and they gave me a discount code. So if in, the, in the description below, you can find the discount code in the link to where I get these shirts. Uh, it's like 10% off and I just get in-store credit. It's not like it's a big deal. Uh, but if you're into nerdy shirts, it's probably something you'll like. I, I, I had a lot of fun with it. All right, anyway, guys, let's get right into the interview. Again, it's about an hour long, um, but I hope you enjoy it, and I think it's uh, a really neat insight into their side of things and kind of their plans and beliefs and views on things. Uh, the Kickstarter does end soon, so there's a link in the description below to follow that. If you are interested in Oathsworn, you only have a few hours left to actually get into it. Uh, at the time of posting, it's probably around the 24-hour mark. So uh, now's your chance if you want to really... Uh, get into that pledge manager and get the game next year. All right, guys, thanks so much. Let's get to it. Um, all right, so, but, uh, you know, just yeah. for, for the viewers, go on and introduce yourselves. Um, hi, well, I'm Jay. <laughs> no, after you. After you. <laughs> you first. Okay, uh, yeah, my name is Toby O'Hara. I am a uh, co-founder of Shadowborn Games, and I um, do all of our sculpting for our, for all sworn into the deep wood and then in the other game that we're going to produce in the hopefully near future. Hey, yeah, and I'm Jamie. I'm um, uh, director of game development, um, so it means I wear lots and lots of different hats. And um, yeah, I'm also co-founder with Toby um, here at Shadowborn Games. Cool, cool. And you guys have a, a, a little game called Oathsworn on Kickstarter right now. <laughs> yeah, it's not just you know, it's like it's one of those pocket. It's a pocket one, you know, one of those ones you just put in your put in your top pocket. You can just... Sure. <laughs> yeah. So um, uh, yeah, it's been amazing. We've had this absolutely crazy month. My goodness, um, we're up to one point seven something million now, and just it's blown our minds. The community's just gathered around this game, and um, it's it's been fantastic. Um, we've had a lot of. Uh, engagement as well we're up to like eleven thousand comments now with people like just hashing out the world and mechanics and um yeah it's been a been a fantastic ride and we're nearly coming to an end <laughs> we can finally have a sleep hey, mate yeah yeah it's it's definitely uh i think it's taken both of you guys' time pretty much non-stop since it launched it but just based off like the the posts and the updates you've done the live streaming sculpting and all that kind of stuff like you guys are uh, definitely yeah, putting in the hours to, yeah we've tried to make sure that we put our you know our immediate face forward like to be present always in the comment section and we're still not as present as we like to be and you know thank you know thank goodness we've had a couple of collaborators that just came from the community that that have just been a blessing to us to help answer questions and and uh, you know keep the discussion going when we can't be there and these are these were just a couple of people that just kind of latched onto the campaign and had a passion for it. We could not be anywhere near where we were if it weren't for the, the amazing help that, that they gave us. So it's you know huge thank you to, to to Mark and to Thomas especially for all the work that they've done on the campaign. And, and we had no idea who they were before this campaign, so it was just a blessing to have them to help out. Yeah, d yeah definitely. And when you see the collaborator uh, tag, like anytime you just see the tag, I think it's really helpful in the comments. Uh, so, yeah. So that, that's yeah. really good. Uh, so you kind of mentioned not knowing them beforehand, and I actually want to kind of talk a little bit before the campaign. What did you guys do? What was the work involved? What's the behind the scenes scoop on like what you did before launching, leading up to the launch? Oh my goodness, that was a, so. Actually, we were because we've been in development for three years, and about a year of about a year of the um, 
uh, of, of that was kind of leading up to the prep work for it. So we had that with there's the um, when you kind of make a really big board game and stuff, you need to um, you really do need to gather a community around it before you get into Kickstarter. Um, like really, the Kickstarter is the last thing you do almost in the string of of, of advertising and getting people and building a community. Um, and so we've had we had um, about four thousand people on our newsletter beforehand going in, and so we spent a whole year trying to like build that uh, build that community and let people know that we were we were coming um, because if we were going to spend you know this, this team of 25 people is going to spend three years getting that ready um we really need to make sure that we, we we people knew what was what was what was coming so when we started out we actually started off with a few um uh just sort of little gamey things because obviously this is a game and like a, a like the game is, is is our passion so we decided the first thing we did was actually do a we did like a riddle um a little image um that was around in i think it was may time we did it um and we we put that out there as a thing just as like a teaser and if you could crack it this riddle which is still online so i won't tell, tell you the answer to it but there's a riddle on the tombstone in the deep wood and if you could crack it um you could actually get a teaser of the website and so that was um that we had loads of people crack that it was really really impressive um because it's quite a hard riddle and they they got to see a bit beforehand and then when we came to uk game expo um in um in the uk that was um that was our first time we really revealed the game and so we had the miniatures and the stuff there so doing the convention scene is super important when you're making it right, making a board game because it really is that's where um all the all the um a lot of the the influencers a lot of the people who are kind of from the press are there to be able to share with everybody else so although like you might only get thirty thousand people i think which just sounds like a huge number but um in the in the grand scheme of things it's it's not that many but then the what what then comes out of that when you know the press gets hold of it and then is able to share it amongst all of the uh, all of the community and the rest of the world that's when you get huge coverage so we had loads and loads of people coming behind uk game expo and there was gen con um and then it was um just doing lots of lots of um uh, spending time just really building this news out so we, we spent a lot of time making the making the updates and um, trying to um trying to encourage the community really and sharing about where we were going with it and um because a lot of a lot of a board game a lot of all this stuff is trust like people have to trust that you you actually care about them and that you're going to finish what you say you're going to finish and that takes time that's not something you can buy and it's not something you can just gain at the snap of a finger you you, you have to work at it and spend time at it so um so that's been real uh, one of our passions is toby and i right at the beginning we to build a community around this world because we want it to be um just this we, we, we want it to be something that's bigger than just a single moment in time and it and it's something that we can grow out and people can kind of kind of um grow old with us inside this world you know as we get as we do more things and and, and explore the deep wood and all the all the crazy stuff there so that that was um that's a few of the things that we did we spent a lot of time trying to build like like me building stuff and uh, when we came up to the, you know finally um, pulled the trigger on the kickstarter we had we had loads of people who were, who were with us. Really, um, it was really exciting, actually. Oh, cool! Yeah, no, definitely. So it sounds like you guys did some cons, you did some newsletters, some kind of fun internet riddles and whatnot. What do you think the most effective thing was for you guys uh, in in getting the word out and getting people to latch on? Did, was it the cons? I don't know what my answer is. Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, maybe you should go first then. We're talking to them. Oh. I think. I think honestly. I think um, the, the 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 stuff that we've been able to do with you on your channel. I think personally has been kind of the biggest impact in terms of getting the game out there to let people know about it. And then you know, obviously, you know, we invited you in very early to do some of the play testing, mm -hmm. and we took a lot of that feedback you gave us, and that actually did make a, a significant impact on some of the design choices we made going forward. Forward. So it wasn't just it wasn't just working with you in terms of even making the game even better, but it was also the, the community that you are growing, that we could be a part of that growing community, I think has been a, a massive help for us. I mean, I think when we started hanging out with you, you were right about 4,500 or 5,000 viewers, and now you're over 11,000. So yeah. it's, it's been, you've doubled since we've known you. So it's, it's been a massive impact, in my opinion. Oh, well, I, yeah, I, that, I appreciate that, it, yeah. Go ahead. That um um feeling of um I think that what what is with with this type of game like there's 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 people who are really passionate about about these types of big mini games big story games um games that have got really like crunchy mechanics and we um like we were fans of, of so we're because we you know we're board gamers we play we play we play board games we followed you way before we started kind of um um you know really kind of trying to engage with you and stuff on terms of the board so we 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 had all these people that we were kind of that we already respected and followed. 
in the community who are like, okay, we go to you for our information already. And I know like, like life is busy, right? There's so much stuff to do. And, and, and people like you are great because you just, you, you actually give us the information that's, that's out there in a nice, succinct way in like 15, 20 minute slots, um, in a really high quality way that just lets you know what you, what you need to know about the gaming world. Cause you know, there's just so much gaming going on. There's like a hundred thousand plus games on BGG. How do you filter that kind of information through, um, you know, like on your own? You, you just can't. And so, um, uh, like it's amazing what, what the people at YouTube, on YouTube and stuff and, um, and influencers have done just, uh, just incredible because it, it really helps. It really helps you kind of just pick through everything to find out the stuff that you're really passionate about. Um, and obviously with, with you, like you, I mean, you and I have probably got the same, same, um, same passions in terms of board games and things. So we, I'm like, okay, right. If I see him, he likes the stuff that I like, then I'm probably going to like what he has to say about other things and, uh, and then follow that. So that was, yeah, really super valuable, I think. Sure. Okay. Well, not to make this all about me. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> though I do appreciate it. No, I think it, it. It, it sounds like the, um, the big point, and I've kind of looked at this too, uh, and, and just other successes on Kickstarter is, um, at all the cons and all the, all the work you guys do with all that. And then when it comes down to it, it sounds like word of mouth is actually kind of your biggest, um, uh, sticky, uh, uh, communication where when people hear about it and then actually visit the, the Kickstarter, look into it, back it, all that kind of stuff. Uh, you mentioned like, you know, you can get 30,000 people you know, that can walk by your booth at a con, but not everybody's going to stop. Right. And so it sounds to me like just the community efforts that you guys have done. Like I've seen, uh, like, like Toby, you, you wrote that amazing post on kind of miniature quality at one point on board game, uh, on BGG and, and just seeing that kind of, interaction and, and the talking to you know other channels and other people that talk to other people uh it sounds like that's kind of the, the biggest takeaway from that yeah i would say because when you're starting from zero you don't have a community right so exactly. you kind of got to find a community to be a part of first ah, yeah and well, then grow from there and then you know then the game starts to change because then you all start to become a, a part of a bigger community so the next time you know the next time a project come, comes around you know, it looks like we're going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 backers. Well, we know that there's at least 10,000 people out there that would be interested in, in, in something that we could bring to, to Kickstarter next time, right? So, I mean, we're, we, we've got that plus all of, you know, the people like yourself that we can talk to and, and, and advertise or, um, you know, to get that word out where it's, it'll be easier, I guess, is a better way to put it next time than when you're starting from scratch with nothing to work with. Oh, well, sure. Yeah, and ideally it snowballs from that too, right? So yeah, ten thousand people yeah. enjoy the game and then talk about it to their friends, yes. and, and and it goes yeah, from there. That, yeah, that's key too. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, but still kind of in that before Kickstarter time. How is it like running a company without a product to sell? What I mean by that is, is you guys have been working on this for so long and been you, you putting a lot of time and effort into it, and the Kickstarter is just now. I mean, even now it hasn't ended yet, so nothing's really come in. How does how does that work behind the scenes there? How does how do you manage that? It's um it's been um it's been a wonderful. World. I think that you're in this. It's really exciting. I think it's the main thing. Excitement is 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 extraordinary because you have this passion, and the passion is becomes a bit contagious with people. Like the whole group kind of becomes like passionate about it. There's a few th- key things I think that actually made made because our 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 team is 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 remote, right? So there's we we're, we're working like eight different time zones. We've got people all over the place. Most of those don't talk to each other, but they're always talking to me or to Toby, like in different things. And we and so it's like keeping the team um, motivated together was like really really important so pretty early on um we we started doing a weekly update and so we actually do a video every week to the whole team to keep everybody like understanding what's happening and it's really nice because it's just a way of like i suppose it's a little bit like our updates that we've done where we've been encouraging the community with the work of other people in the community um like the art contests and the story things like people love seeing what other people in the team are doing and like like being able to praise them and being out of being able to encourage them and then in likewise being encouraged in return like when the time comes so that's what we, we do on the weekly update we send out this thing that shows all the different stuff that people have done and it's, it's really wonderful because people um people then get a chance to like thumbs up all the stuff that's going on across the world and they get to feel part of this because being part of something is, is the fundamentally i think what makes a makes a team like if you like you can actually be at a workplace and not actually feel part of where you are working like you're not necessarily in a team you're just it's just somewhere you go and get paid to do a job but like being part of a team is, is kind of a different thing it's you you need to you want to feel like you're you're at you're giving to the team and you're receiving from the team and the whole and everyone's kind of in it together to a goal and and that was something that we thought was really precious early on so that was 
Um, so it started, it kind of started with this you know, sharing of information, letting it, helping everyone to kind of like see what everyone else, else is doing. So everyone's along for this ride with as much information and transparency as possible. Um, and then it's about passion. Like it's about like building that team in the first place was about people like, cause Toby and I started this, this, this thing where we, where we both had this dream of this, this ridiculously grand game. Like it's the sort of thing that like, like, like few large companies in the world would try what we're trying to do here. And like being and like, you know, two guys coming out with this thing and be like, okay, we're going to put, are we prepared to put three years of our life into this? And that kind of, the, I think the, 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 the passion alongside the willingness to show commitment to it. So like when you're, you know, you talk about it for a couple of weeks and it's like, well, it's not, you know, you're not really committed to it. But after you've done it for a couple of years and you start saying, here's what we've done, look all this stuff that's come out, look all this here's how much effort we put into it we're really passionate about this world and here look listen to this story look at this artwork and just see all this cool stuff that the team is doing and as that builds up over time and over time it almost it becomes a snowball effect where you like where now adding new people to that team and they get to see like what happens week to week and they get to feel all the progress that's been made um is is, is super easy and so like because you just you go to someone and just point them to some of the artwork and they're just oh yeah i definitely want to get involved in this so um um, and we're actually recruiting more people now um, to, the, to the team as well, like to speed up processes and get things. Now we've got a certain funding level. We're able to kind of scale a little bit more and, and get things out. Um, um, uh, yeah, like, in a, um, you know, get, get some more uh, uh, skills into the team. But, yeah, so it's, it's, it's the combination of that. I think it's that passion, the, the, the passion and that, that being a team together. And then I think it, it makes that a lot easier because something that's really hard is that long period of time where you're not seeing anything coming in. You're just, it's all going out. And it's always that fear. There's always a fear that's kind of working against that passion, which is like, what if it all just goes upside down and nothing ever comes of it? And you've got all that. But the thing that keeps you through that is the fit is like the sentiment of the whole team because everybody's encouraging and going like, don't worry, this is going to be fine. This is going to be great. And so the more people we talk to about it through the team over time, people, more and more people. And that's when we were talking to people like you. We were talking to like, like Paul Grogan, like all these people who are like, who have been around the board gaming world for a long time and they look at it and go yeah you're onto something here like this is actually gonna this is gonna be okay you're gonna land well with this and that's then really really encouraging um and it gives you the strength to kind of keep pushing through because you just need to refuel all the time as you're going through a three-year process we're not getting anything at all exactly. in terms of payment you know but you know we've I've, I've had two kids whilst we've been doing this like you know like like times have been tough like trying to get this like, like stay to keep a family going and keep this game going and keep the team going all this kind of thing and so you really need to be fueling all the time because i think if you don't have have a team and a passion right behind that you it's going to crumble at some point so that was i think that was key for us um that, and at the good. macro level jamie's really good with budgets and i'm really good at finding money <laughs> so <laughs> very perfect put all this stuff together i think it was one point probably about six months ago where, where we i think we needed to come up with a little bit more money because we wanted to do different advertising i'm like yeah yeah i can go get it don't worry about it and jamie just stopped he goes is this your life savings i said yes absolutely it is where else is this coming from <laughs> We're completely self-funded. And, and I had made that choice three years ago when we, you know, after we had spent a year coming up with the idea for this world and with the metaphysics of this world war and all the cool ideas and the things we wanted to do and the places we wanted to go, we went away for like a, a week and then Jamie came back and said, okay, this is what I'm thinking for the combat system. And it was the first time I saw the dice system with the exploding dice mechanic, the hit mechanic, how the, the, the hit and the wound is all in the same role, and the, the first iteration before Battleflow. And right there and then, I said, this is going to be huge. I know it's going to be huge because we're all board gamers, and we had so much fun just because we had been playing. That was our first time playing inside Tabletopia, so that's we've been able to test this game forever since its initial conception. We've been able to play test it every single every single week, just playing playing the game over and over and over again. And um, right from there and then, I was totally sold. It was never I never looked back to, in terms of just throwing everything I had at making this game become a reality. Well, well the, um, I think the, that's nice. The, Go ahead. Sorry. The the the, um, the, the um, oh, what was I going to say? The um, yes, yeah, so, so something about the about about play testing as well. Like because once you've once you've got a game that's got like a three year. Um, dev cycle to it like the something that that come up in in, in games life cycle is oh, do you get bored of playing it like are you like because after a while like you know you play a game a th- like when you're playing it as a designer or as like a, a you know someone on the team you, you know you might play it a hundred times and that's like way more than anyone who's buying the game will play it perhaps so like exactly. like you've got if, if you get to like a hundred playthroughs and you're still saying yeah actually I, I look forward to playing my next one that's not too bad like 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 because you're bound to get bored even of your own thing at some point or another and so that was 
that's something that we've been aware of like when we've been doing play testing what should be like do they want more if they want more then it's probably it's you know, if you ever get bored of it then that's probably a, a red flag um but i don't know about you, so but i find that i i just i i like i like that looking forward to the next game i'm going to play even i'm fighting the same thing like i've fought a thousand times before or whatever because it's kind of does that thing so that's, that was one of that's another like um like indicator i think in dynamic game size do you ever get bored of your own game if you do then you probably want to put it to bed because someone else is going to get bored of it at some point as well you know yeah definitely definitely no i think that's really important uh and your guys's answer actually kind of led to the next one anyway so i was wondering what caused you guys to make a board game what, what was it passion was it boredom? Was it like, did you guys have a, do you guys have a eureka moment? Like, you know, we could actually build a game around this concept. Uh, what, what made you go from playing board games to let's make one together? Can I, can um, I give you the, the initial passion part of it? Cause Jamie sure. will have a far better explanation in terms of the academic reasons why we went the certain way we did. But I grew up a Warhammer fan, Warhammer fantasy. I spent a decade reading all the novels. I loved the old world. I play. I still play Warhammer online, even though it's not technically in existence anymore. There's a group of devs that have kept Warhammer online alive. There's a couple of streamers on uh, Twitch that have kept it alive, and it's and free to play. And Age of Reckoning. Yep, you can still play it to this moment. And and as, you know, Games Workshop has basically turned a blind eye to it and said, as long as you guys aren't taking money for it, you guys can play it, and it's been amazing. But that has been. When, when the Age of Sigmar line dropped and they killed the old world, it's just they, they had ripped something that I loved completely out from underneath me. It was gone overnight. All of the places, all of the things that I loved were just gone. And I wanted, I was so upset. And I love, I still love the Age of Sigmar line. I have way too many models from the line and, and I still play it, but I, I miss the old world and miss that story. And when, we started thinking of what we wanted to do. I wanted to create something that I could love the way I loved the old world in a, in a place that we could grow the way the old world was grown into something that you can grow into and expand and make into this, you know, multi-decade franchise if you can do it the right way. So you, you were more into the IP of it and just yes, create yeah. a, a world. Okay, yeah. cool. Yeah. In the, in the, um, in those early days, I remember having those conversations about what sort of game it would it would be, and we were talking about, you know, would it be a skirmish game? Would it be a thing, you know, this sort of game? And it was something that, um, if there's, it feels like there was like a space in board gaming for, um, a big IP game that was actually born out of board gaming. Like it's often IPs that are brought in from outside of board gaming and made, and then like converted into mechanics for, for a board game or something. This I was really passionate about making a board game that a, a game is actually, it's actually born out of board game mechanics. It's born out of, um, our community and then it may go out to others in the future. But this is, we really want to make this strong story. So for, for us, the world building was absolutely key. Like right at the beginning, our, our evenings were just me and Toby sitting down for like six hours at a time talking about world building, you know, starting with the very first question of like, is there a God in this world? What happens if there is? What sort of God is it? What, how does it work? you know and and then it's um and, and then it was like you know the fundamental metaphysics and and the uh, nature of good and evil and um you know all these kind of uh, these kind of things that built up around uh, this core concept so it, very, it started off very cosmic and cosmology i've actually got a degree in um i've got a degree in, in theology as well as games design so i've got so that kind of came together gotcha. quite nicely at that point that was my that was my passion so it's me with a, uh, a glass of whiskey and so we talking about talking about cosmology um in board games and um and then it, from that, what, what was quite strange is, is the Deepwood was not where we started. The Deepwood actually came out of the metaphysic, weirdly. So as we spent a load of time, months and months talking about this, um, we, the, the Deepwood actually came out as a natural ramification of the metaphysic of the universe. Um, and so, and the moment that we had the Deepwood, that's where we realized that's where the game is going to be set because the Deepwood just felt like this place that you could have this great, great kind of, um, tension. Um, it was the, it was the great antagonist and the Deepwood itself became the enemy of this game. And then, and it, then it was like, well, okay, who's in there how the humans work all that kind of thing um and it and, and it kind of led to the oath sworn and the fight against the dark stuff the there were beasts that come out of the deep wood and things um but but yeah so it was um it was it, it that 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 was a big process actually i think that took quite a few months before we even got to the fundamental game that is now oath sworn it was really about this building this world first because that was it like if you can build 
Because I think of all the, if you think back of all the great fantasy things you actually care about, it really is about the world building primarily, right? You you like the setting of a world, and then after that, you love the characters in that world and how they interact with the world itself. Um, and so we we had an extra dimension to that, which is then we had the mechanics as well. Because it's not just about having a good story; you also need to have a good mechanic. You need to have something that's not been done before that's actually worth making. Because there's no point in making a game if it's rehashing what's been done before. Um, it's you, you know you, you want to have, bring something to the market that is actually going to give something um to to, to people that they haven't they haven't had so that's when we that's with the, you know, the combat stuff and things we were we were doing we were looking at um, new ways to do combat resolution um how do you really kind of make it feel like you're swinging an axe and deciding how hard you're going to swing with that thing and that's where the push your luck thing came in so you can do these like quick little jabs or you can do these massive raw swings with huge damage but then it's you know, you're more likely to miss because the enemy can see you coming um the idea of the battle flow system where you're kind of breathing through combat and you're keeping moving keep you have to keep this momentum up that the flow of battle has to come together so that you can chain one attack into another um, and, and all, all these kind of things that we're trying to capture a feeling like what does it feel like to be hit what does it feel like to attack somebody what does it feel like to be in a fight over you know 60 seconds and uh, and try and survive it so yeah there was quite a lot of considerations on on that side of things going to it but it really did start with the, the world the passion like we want to build something people can care about you know? and, and definitely big picture too and then you kind of iterated smaller and smaller uh, very cool. Very interesting. I've always yeah, wondered, we had a, I've always a lot why. of stuff out of that first game. Yeah, there was there was a lot of cool ideas we had. And we're like, we can't we can't fit it in the box. It just physically won't fit in. So we're gonna have to make another game just to do other things that we want. Okay, well we'll, to we'll, be we'll talk about other games and, and, and not not yet. <laughs> Yeah, we ended up having to put it in two boxes anyway, didn't we, Toby? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sure. yeah. It was going to be one box. Then we realised that you know they just don't make boxes that big. Like, yeah. it's, uh, we needed we needed two boxes to to fit it in. So um, yeah, it's ended up quite quite a beast. But yeah. Um, yeah, hopefully, it's, people it's, enjoy it. It's that's what, I mean. The reason it's so big. I mean, people might be wondering about that actually. Why why is it such a massive massive game? And the reason is because the one of the core design philosophies is the idea of giving unique experiences each chapter. So when you fight something, you're not just fighting the same thing over and over, and over again, and you're not doing the same story over and over again, and you're unlocking new things. So you're unlocking boxes and envelopes with cool stuff that you um, like new mechanics and new things as you go through this legacy element that, that, that kind of comes in um and so there's in that in the in the desire to make an ep- basically a gamified epic novel but then you're also bringing in in the same way that you don't reread chapters in a book you also don't want to replay um fights in a in a, in, in the game so we have a, you know each of these chapters has a unique monster um and each of the story chapters has new, unique mechanics and things that it's doing that involve extra components so there's just huge amounts of components that even if you're following the kickstarter you haven't seen them yet because we're actually they're obviously hidden behind these things we you know we're just calling mystery box and envelopes but there's loads of cool stuff that um that you're going to be able to open as you go through um as as it's as it's, as it's primarily about having a new experience each time you come back because ultimately games big games like this can fall foul of of repetition if you if you're not careful because they you know you can play five or six chapters and you're like, oh this is really cool and then when you get to the seventh or eighth you find that the group just wants to move on to something else because they feel like they've done the game so that, that was a real key thing it's like how do you make people feel like they haven't done the game so that they're always looking forward to the next chapter because ultimately this story you want people to get to the end of the story and having having enjoyed it um but one of the things that will defeat that is if people get bored like four or five chapters in so um a lot of effort was put in like how do you how do you address that you know you give them a unique story give them a unique monster to fight with a unique mechanic and you give them cool unlocks every time they haven't seen before guaranteed um and that that really helps people pro- pro- propel people chapter to chapter so it's the, the, the hopefully what we're trying to capture is the idea of a board game that's a bit like a page turner with you're reading a book you know you just can't put it down you want another thing to to do that's the that was the game and that was the um the goal anyway no I, and i think it worked out well I, like i like that you guys you guys call it chapters and uh it i've, I've seen people talk about painting the, the mystery miniature, right? And like, oh, how do we do that? I want it painted when we first see it. And uh, they're like, well, we'll just stop after uncovering the card and then paint it. I'm like, you guys aren't going to want to stop. You're not going to want to stop. <laughs> I've, I, I, I've, I've played it like four or five times. You're not, you're going to want to keep going. The moment you just revealed the big guy, and then it's like putting the book down. It's like, no, you're going to read, you're going to stay up late. You're going to read one more chapter. Uh, so I think, I think that works out really well. Uh, okay. So I'm going to, um, I, I don't mean this to be a curveball, um, but I, I find these kind of things interesting and I want to pick your guys' brain. Um, now that we're kind of getting towards the very end of the campaign now, looking back on it, is there one thing that you would change? Oh, like, I would be more prepared. <laughs> like, a year was not enough time. My goodness, it was not enough time. Like, and really what it was, I suppose the, um, uh, the, 
and it was and, and you know it was it was um things like the the amount of time it would take to do an update for instance like so but at the moment like my life is i get i get up i spend eight or nine hours writing an update and then i then I, then, I, then i do some other work my normal work and then i go to bed like and then, and then get up and do the same thing i would definitely have prepared that more in time though to be fair looking back we didn't have that time to prepare anyway so like you know it always you know we were working so hard with the advertising and everything else beforehand and then getting keeping the team on on track that um, we wouldn't have had that but next time like definitely preparing more for that for that campaign because i don't think we were ready for just how much it would it would take to be as i suppose as be as as present as we wanted to be with the, the community because as soon as we got into that first day i was like the community needs more than this they need more than just a simple update and then we need to spend more time being able to talk things through and, and like and that and then, then you know it was on the fly you know the art contest the story contest like oh wait how can this is going to be a great way of helping people like you know encourage each other things so i'd like to say that it was all like some like genius plan to have all this community stuff but actually it was like it was almost like panic on day one and realized, man, we, we need way more than we're doing here because you can just feel the sentiment of the community wanting more, um, more engagement, you know, from the, from the thing. And so, um, and that, thankfully, now, I think that it's, that, <laughs> now that you say that the one thing that we focused on the most at the beginning, which was the story was the one thing that caught us off guard when people keep saying, give us more, which was the lore. And we hadn't done a whole lot of preparing the lore for, for public consumption. It was all, yeah, it certainly. There, was, there was tons and tons of documents that we had created that we use internally for sharing the lore with the writers and with us internally. And we hadn't distilled that into a form that could be given to the community yet. And that was, that was the thing we spent the most time on, which naturally you would hope the community would want that to post. And we just, we just didn't have that right there. So that's why Jamie has to spend so much time prepping some of the lore pieces of all those updates is because we've got to go back, find all those documents and, and distill it from 20 pages down to four paragraphs so that people could read it. <laughs> Get rid of all the spoilers. The spoilers right. are everything. Oh, yeah. Because obviously yeah. the, writers, the writers have all these spoilers because they need to know them. But um, <laughs> for us, it's, uh, yeah, <laughs> we, need to, we need to be able to save people from that. Yeah, I, I bet. And that's actually, so my, my next question is, you guys have a game that you inherently kind of can't talk about fully, right? You're, 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 you're hamstringed <laughs> with these. Well, uh, you know, there's all this stuff and just trust me, there's stuff and it's cool. How, how, how does, how did, how did that work when it came to pitching your game to, 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 to backers, to, you know, people like the cons, like, like, okay, this is just a small snippet and there's more stuff, but I can't show you. Like, how, did you think that hurt or helped? Do you think people were curious? about it or do you think people are like i i need to know more before i'm actually interested uh you know where did you decide how much to show how how did all that kind of work the com- I think the community has kind of been primed for this game. Like this, the, I, th- I think part of, I mean, I'd like to say the success is all because we've done loads of hard work and all these things, but I think part of the success of this has been that it's, it's hitting the market at the right time. Um, like that the people are ready for, um, I, I like the games like legacy games and, and unlock games, uh, exit games, you know, the kind of escape room games and things like that. I think generally like that kind of, um, mystery game where you don't actually see what's in the box before you, before you buy it, but you know, there's going to be something there like that, that had to exist. I think that had, that had to be antecedent to this game for this game to really work because this is too, almost too big without having that kind of the community being like, Oh yeah, hold on. Wait, I, I, I like mystery and I, I would, I like to buy mystery. Mystery now has a value like, and that's only really come about this last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the market, I think generally will go more into that in the future. Genuine. I think that, um, that, we, cause I think we realize that we often don't play games more than a half dozen times each before we get, get move on to the next game. And it's like, okay, in those games, then what I want is experiences. And that's what this game is. It's the grand experience game where you just, ha- you have a moment in time and then you have another moment in time and you go back to it. Now, obviously with our game, we wanted to have it so you could do the whole thing again. So you could actually have two moments in time because you can actually go through the story in a different way that you don't see the paths that you didn't walk through this other way. Um, uh, the, the first time through the game, but, um, but yeah, generally keeping it as a, um, yeah, that those ex- that that I think that has a value to people. So that's part. Of th- so I think there's enough of the people who haven't um, looked in the mystery box um, who will who will be lo- like pleasantly surprised by that when they when they finally finally get to open it. But at the same time, I think not making people have to choose was part of that. Um, and that, we actually came to you, didn't we? we? We took some great advice from you. Like you know, you were you were you know, I asked we, before we um, before we came to the campaign, I was asking Michael like, what do you think? You know, do you think that we should hide? Because we were, at the time we were wondering, could is it possible to run a completely mysterious campaign? Like, could you actually could you actually run it where you don't show any of the monsters to anybody? Um, and would anybody buy that? Like, and and Mike was like, well, actually, I'm, I I 
you know, I'd like to look, I like to see what I'm able to get. Um, and as we went around to a bunch of different people we respected and, and talked to, we, we had, um, we had people coming up with different, different on, on a spectrum, kind of different, um, different places on that. Like some people said, I'd love the mystery. Some people said, I don't really want the mystery. And then we realized we don't really need to make people choose. They can, they can choose for themselves. So we had this little wall that says you can click through it and go and see it. So I think that that's where we haven't lost people. I think we would have lost people had we not done that, but there's another, but, because for, for a lot of people, I think for the kind of person who's going to click through that, they actually wanted it's the minis they wanted to they wanted to see. Now, what's nice about that is though, because there were so many minis in that original initial box, so much kind of proof of of work effectively that you know, like there's all these big monies and you can see the quality of them, you see what you're going to get. Um, it meant that then for our stretch goals, um, we felt that we were confident enough that actually we can give those people a mystery. Still, there's actually a bunch of mystery monsters that they, they, even the people who click through the thing aren't going to see. And that means they're going to get an extra surprise on top of having seen the things on top of, you know. So, um, so it's, uh, there's, everyone's going to have mystery in their monsters. It's just how much mystery you're going to have. Yeah. And even when you clicked yeah. on that image, you guys still left <laughs> a mystery there. Uh, so. Yeah. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. The last boss. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which, which, which is cool. I mean, that, that, that's, that's, that's really good. Um, so. Talking about the, the lore again here, uh, were you guys as surprised as perhaps I was when it came to the outpouring of short stories and art and just the amount of time investment on people who don't even own the game yet, uh, probably have never even played it and are just fascinated by the world you guys made? Completely blown away. Yeah, it was humbling and, and exciting. It, it felt like we had we had, we had grown or earned, I don't know if earned is the right word, a, a community almost almost instantly, which was our main goal from the beginning. It was, it was to release a game and try to develop a community out of this that we could then grow the world and grow our company with. And the you know the, when the story started coming in and how well everybody grasped the the feel of the world and, and that that the mood and, and, and even the lore mechanics themselves, how quickly they, they picked up on all that, despite not having a whole lot of information to work with, which just, it was, it was, it blew my mind. And then the artwork started rolling in and the creativity started coming in. It's just, it's everything that I would personally was hoping for is to get to that point where we get to see that first piece of fanfic or that first piece of fan art and, and have it grow from there. And it just, I was hoping we would be there a year from, and we're there before we even get out of the Kickstarter campaign. Exactly. So it's, yeah. it's amazing. Yeah, that's, I... I, I'm, I'm so excited that they, that the people grasp that. I mean, I've, I've, we've been reading every entry that's come in. We've had over a hundred stories, entries from people. We've had, we've had, I don't know how many dozen art pieces of artwork we've had done now, but the story entries, like a lot of the time we have these, these stories, a couple of things have come through again and again and again. So the first thing is that people keep saying, I couldn't not write something about the, about the world. I just needed to write something. Like I had this idea and I just, I've never written before, but I'm just going to write it down for you. And it's just amazing. Like they, they, um, uh, they, they, you know, they, the people would spend time, hours of time writing something, you know, um, to, to, to kind of share with the community. Um, and, uh, the other thing is that the, uh, what was the other thing? Oh, I forgot what the other thing was. Sorry. I'm really tired. It's been a long month. Sorry. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see if I can remember what the other thing was. Um, no, it's gone out of my head. It'll come, come, come back to me later. If it comes later. back, yeah, and, we'll give you time. Okay. And then we had that piece of artwork that came in from Emma. You know, a, a 13 year old yeah. girl who does I, an amazing piece of artwork. I, I pulled my daughter just, and showed her, showed her that. It just, it just immediately just changes your entire perspective on your on everything, life, community, the whole nine yards. When when a young person can embrace the world that you created for them and then just do an amazing piece of art too you know for her age that was an incredible piece of artwork so that was that was probably my favorite moment in the whole in the whole campaign yeah, you see yes the, ima the age, imagination but... stuff is incredible right like, like the like i thought that we'd have pictures drawings um by you know by a bunch of people doing different set scenes and things and then when people start coming out with like hand carved wooden skulls <laughs> and like mm -hmm. you know people start making crochet a dendry and uh, oh, sorry felt, felt, felted a dendry and um and all that and you're like and the eight bit that's, the eight bit computer yeah, eight -bit video game yeah <laughs> that's so good um <laughs> by andre yeah that was that was so cool so um yeah no the, and the fact that these um a lot of these things were so law um law grounded that was the other thing i was going to say that the law 
especially in the story, like in stories as well, like the fact that when, when people come through, they say like, I've been, I've looked back through everything you've ever written, <laughs> like to see what it is that the law is so that I can make it so that it's, it's on. So there's only, there's only been like two or three stories out of a hundred that I've actually had to go back and say, Hey, look, actually this bit, this is actually the law for this thing. Maybe you'd like to, you know, do your fancy to change it a bit, but you know, they don't have to, you don't want to, but um, this will be the law for that bit. Um, so, that, um, and, and, but, but yeah, like nearly, nearly everybody has just, just been completely grounded in law because they've just done the research and that's 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 a lot of work you know to, to find a you know to work out what what's happening in the world so um yeah just amazing i think now that man now the key is is to um is for us to be able to try and enc- keep keep encouraging that because there is it's 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 wonderful so we want to keep trying to run competitions throughout the year and i really want to try and find a way of sharing the the art in a compendium somehow like either maybe we'll, we'll print one or we'll do a pdf of one or we'll make a gallery of something just do something that allows people to kind of have a, a hub by which they can put all this this artwork in there and everyone can be encouraged by what you know what other people are doing um same thing with the short stories really because i think um like for instance, just the other day we had someone had a great idea um i, th- I think we're sharing their story uh, uh, tonight, perhaps, but they had this cool idea about like um, about the Inquisition and how they would use the ashes of the burnt witches on their faces as a like a as a, a like a blood rite for the young recruits to the Inquisition. I was like, mate, you've just made canon there, and so like I told them, like, that's now canon. <laughs> and now he's got a piece of canon in the world. Now it's great that you can actually do that, like have have people write in that actually is way better than anything you could think of, and then it becomes like part of the, this evolving thing. Because I think that's another thing with like any any kind of good IP. Generally, it's not it's not it's not founded in the core team so much as it is in the in the life the community basically makes it much bigger than it is it's like it's a seed that then grows because the community engages with it and then like the, the, the it's just our job to listen to what other people are saying and then like integrate all the best bits as it kind of grows out it becomes this it becomes bigger than than it was um you know bigger than the seed you know yeah definitely definitely that's that, that's really cool that you're incorporating uh parts of it too uh my votes at least on an art book because uh, i i do love those but what will we'll, you know i'm sure you guys will you know, uh, immortalize it however, however it needs to be. Uh, so real quick on the gameplay and you've, we've kind of talked about how, I mean, the story is grandiose. I mean, and, and, and kind of an, at the, at least the world is, uh, you guys have gone, you know, up to cosmic <laughs> and, uh, theological views on it. And a lot of times when people have that kind of big kind of viewpoint, they make something that's more sandboxy, that's more kind of open ended. Uh, but you guys have wanted to instead actually write a story, um, that goes through this world, um, at, at kind of a low level, at a very personal level. Um, but then swap that up again, where all of the game mechanics from the, the choosing dice versus cards to how many dice to where to go to all that is all player choice. And so what, what caused you guys to almost seem to have uh, mirrored versions of typical games in there where, where the, the, the player can choose so many different things, yet they're going through the motions of this experience, these chapters that you've already set up. So the, um, I, I, I came, come from a, a computer game background as well. Like most of my life I played, I played PC games and, and, and living through the evolution of, of PC games, which was an um, incredible journey, seeing how communities grab different ideas that were for like, you know, games design philosophies and ran with them was, was interesting. So, um, if you're into computer games, you might know about the, um, the kind of the sandbox dilemma that kind of happened during the early 2000s. Um, uh, and well, 2000s to 2010 sort of time where basically uh, they, they started like mechanically, they could start creating infinite universes so you could make like star systems that were you know you could, you could make them um, galaxies worth of places to visit or you could have entire planets where you could go anywhere you wanted and drill down into it and do anything you wanted um but the dilemma became is that what people found is when they went from one planet to another when they got to the new planet they it was the same as the one they just come from because it's not possible in that kind of um uh, endlessly and endless, the endless expanse of space to actually create infinite story that's deep and rich and interesting um and so the, the reaction to that so that was like i mean you talk about like you know billion dollar kind of movement of the industry um went away from sandbox complete sandbox and down to the fact that you're actually telling a story so you have this in you have a you have a some elements of sandbox so you have the freedom to choose where you go and some other things but there is actually a story being told primarily and that's the main thing you're doing in the game um, and you can go and do some kind of repeatable content type things but generally you're always sort of drawn back into this this main story because that's what people really want they want to they want something they can care about they want they want to experience um and 
you you actually you actually actually works against you. Try to make something sandbox actually works against the idea of having experiences because it ends up becoming very flat, very bland. Like you, you no matter where you go, you end up the, the kind of wider you go with choice, the the more bland it becomes. Um, um, but then if you have no choice, you're on rails, which is is it's just as bad, right? Um, uh, for a game, it's good for a story because that's exactly what story uh, like a like a book is. But um, but for a game, you want you need to have choices. So there's a there's kind of like a sweet spot you have to feel out between um, infinite choice and kind of like being on rails. And that was that's where the the design mechanics were were born around that. Like, how do you create choice? And then obviously we had these great games like from the past. I used to I used to sit in the library at school all day, like at lunchtime, reading these choose your own adventure books and fighting fantasy books, and you know going through this thing and just loved loved where that where they were going and thinking that why do I not play those anymore as an adult? And uh, I was thinking, well, it's, it's not because the, the mechanic isn't fun. I was absolutely enthralled with the mechanic, um, but generally they were aimed at an age group. They were aimed at high school kind of, kind of that kind of, that kind of age group. They sold incredibly well. Um, but I, I, I had not got back into it as an adult. Um, and even though I actually bought them all again as an adult, I started reading them and it didn't, it didn't, it didn't grip me again, like in the same way. Um, and that's when I thought that actually there is, there is space to, to do what, you know, there's space to do an, a kind of more adult version of that. And uh, there's a there's space to do an adult story, but, but try and make it, um, make it so you can choose with the paths you go through. So this is where, um, that's really where it came from is the desire to tell a story whilst also playing a game. And what do those two things, two things look like? And it took us, it took us um, months to actually crack that, how to make that into a board game. Cause it's not just about it being a choose. It's not like a choose your own adventure game. It's a twisting tales game. And that's based in this idea of the map navigation, how you have these locations you can go to. You're on a hunt. You are these like contract killers. You're, you're coming in to, to deal with a, the problem that this city has or this town has. And um, you're trying to hunt this thing. And, um, and so you have to, you have to be able to choose which way you go and there can be like more or less efficient paths to that. Um, and you can, you get rewarded or, um, uh, you get rewarded, um, for the, the choices you make. You can make your characters, um, how you want. So you can be pragmatic and altruistic. You can, you know, you're, we live in the gray. We, they're like, is, is, is kind of what we try and say in, in, internally in the team. So we, the decisions that need to be real dilemmas, because obviously black and white is often in itself a form of no, no, no choice, right? Because either you choose to be evil or you choose to be good. But if you can have something that's gray, you're actually weighing up like the moral values systems of your characters and whether or not sure. you're you know would your character do this and is it actually in the long run going to be beneficial to the goal so like the so i was trying to find those moments where you might want to be trying to help people but actually trying to help somebody may actually endanger your life in such a way as you won't actually be able to stop this monster and if that kills if that kills you it kills the whole town <laughs> so so if you can't it's like you know how, how much am i prepared to actually give up to try and reach this ultimate goal which is save everybody's life from this um, from this horrendous monster yeah, exactly. um exactly. Th- things like that came in but yeah there's there's a and, and the, the choose play your, the choose your, the um, play your way systems really came out of the fact that it's not it turned out it's just not that expensive to give people that kind of choice like it doesn't cost that much to add the combat system in because i suppose that comes down to the design philosophy behind it is that when you're looking at the um when we started out we wanted the game to be able to be um to, to be replicated and de-leveled and to be scalable and all the, and it needs to have a load of functions. And um, part of that is that you make it so that a couple of key statistic changes, um, or a couple of key things would actually allow you to change the levels of monsters and other things like that. So one of them is like with, with might, um, the, the might needed to be able to scale up it through like 20 levels and all this sort of thing. And so because of that, um, it's, it, it became this thing that could be represented on dice and or cards. It wasn't, um, it had to be quite simple to allow, to allow that. So, for instance, it's not like huge reams of text and loads of statistics, which you couldn't then re- easily replicate between dice and cards, because either you'd have it all on the cards and wouldn't be able to put it on the dice, or you'd, um, you know, you, and so with this way you could have the combat system and the dice system um, together, and just for not a lot more money you can actually make that make that possible for people. Then why make people choose? Because obviously some people prefer one or the other. Um, same thing with the with the with the app. Like, um, although that is that is really expensive, but in being able to do that being able to sort out the issue of what happens if no one in your group really likes reading publicly um what happens you know you don't want to lose a lot of people by the fact that you can't um you, you know that and, and also the quality of your story is actually dependent on an audio but like we probably all listen to audiobooks and have bad readers of audiobooks and you just i mean you can just turn it off right sometimes if it's a bad audiobook you just don't listen to it because it's it's um it's it's it's, it's kind of starts to grate on the ear um and i'm sure the same thing can be true of like some game groups right you might you might not have somebody who's really able to 
um, project, you know, the, the, the value, the, the story through the things or we'll do voices and all that sort of thing. So we wanted to be able to sort that issue out for people so that they could just have somebody who is a professional be able to read that story to them. Um, just dealing with a bunch of different problems really that arise from this type of game and kind of, you know, I suppose in this case is unique to this game, you know, actually having a, I think, I don't know if it's one of the first sort of audio narrated uh, choose your choose, choose, choose your path kind of it's, it's um, one, adventure game. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I but don't I'm, know. I don't know if any of us will read it as good as James Cosmo. So that, that's a high bar to to, to go towards. <laughs> Jamie does a pretty good job when he, he does. He does great. When he does the DM. Yeah, always, I, I, I've had to say it because because we never were able to get it into Tabletopia, so I've had to do it about a thousand times. So every time we have a play a play session or something like that with somebody new, we tend to read it to them. Um, so yeah, I've, I've got used to doing Mitch's Cockney voice now. <laughs> James did a, a good uh, a good Mitch voice as well. Um, okay, all right, well, great. That's that's definitely in depth. Uh, it, it sounds like the key is to make it work on dice, and if it can work on dice, it can work on cards. If it can work on cards. It might or might not work on dice, uh, just because there's less information you can put there. Uh, okay, interesting, cool. Does the story of Osworn have a clear ending? Uh, sorry, Toby, I feel like I'm... I'm t- <laughs> <laughs> you, do you want, you want to ask this one? Yes and no. Um, there is a story in this game that is being told. You will... You were definitely, there's definitely a, a, a period at the end of the sentence. It's not this massive cliffhanger, but it is also opening the door to the wider world. So this is kind of your, your first jaunt into this world. And there is a definitive story that we're telling. So there is a beginning, a middle, and an end. You will have an experience. You will get that full, just like when you watch a movie, you will have that full story being told to you. And there, there is finality and there is a conclusion. But then there's also the, huh. There's a whole lot more to this world than we just showed you. This was just a scratch, and there's a whole lot more to come. So there, there is there is a definitive ending to this. And at the same time, it's opening up other doors along the way, too. Cool. Perfect. Perfect. Sounds good. Um, so uh, along those lines, yeah. what, what does the, uh, the kind of the, the post-campaign look like for you guys? Sleep, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and after for, that, well, on, on my side, it's it's a lot of you know it's it's the manufacturing prep and and working with our manufacturing partner to make sure that the, the models are going to be exactly what we intended them to be in, in terms of design and, and aesthetic and quality and we that process of finding that manufacturer you know that was a multi multi month process probably a good six or eight months worth of talking with manufacturers, it really getting under the hood of what their business is like in terms of their manufacturing capabilities and their manufacturing engineering know-how because we're trying to do something that really the only company that I know of that does it does it well is Games Workshop when it comes to push fit minis. So when it comes to having access to engineering know-how to execute that, you know, we can't go knock on Games Workshop's door and say, hey, can we can you help us develop these minis? We've got to do that on our own. And that's where, um, you know, my experience in manufacturing, James, who is our engineer, his experience in manufacturing, we can take the things that we have learned over, you know, combined, we've got 40 years of experience between the two of us, all of the things that we know and learn. And now we get to apply that to it. What's essentially a toy, right? So, I mean, we're used to dealing with things that fly in space or go into somebody's body for a medical device. And now we're making something that's going to go on somebody's tabletop that they're going to play with. But you take those same engineering practices and principles and you're, you know, you're, you know, it's like using a, a nuclear weapon to blow up a molehill or something like that. You know, you're, you're using this engineering capability to, to do something that hasn't been done before. So it's not like we could have, you know, called up all the different board game manufacturers and said, Hey, we want to push, make push fit minis. Can you do that for us? They would all said, no, we can't because they don't have, that experience in house. And so we had to bring that to the table. So our, our search for a manufacturer was more about what are your, what's your equipment capabilities? What is your engineering capabilities? Because we're going to, we know we need to supplant whatever the gap is between where we are and where we need to go. And we were blessed to find, uh, you know, a true manufacturing partner who wanted to not only allow us the access to their engineering team to implement what we're trying to do, but also they want to bring up, 
you know, it's almost like a joint venture experience with, with our, with our manufacturers is they're using this as an opportunity to increase their capabilities at the same time as working with us to do something that really only one other company really is doing in the world right now. So the next, you know, I guess before we actually go to manufacturing, it's, you know, the next five, six months is going to be all about perfecting these models for, that's from my side, right? About the, the, focusing on these models because we already know they've got, all the cardboard and the cards and the game board, they're already world-class in that department. So it's just a matter of transferring art files at that point. But when it comes to the, to the minis, we, we, we share a, a, the lion's share of that engineering workload is really on us. So that's going to be what James and I will be doing. We've already started doing it, you know, but it's, it's, um, that's what we're going to be focusing on in the next few months. Um, so I, I don't want any specifics here, but I'm going to kind of talk about maybe your five or 10 year plan here. Uh, from a company. So for, as far as Shadowborn Games is, is concerned, um, in the future, are you guys, uh, is, are you guys just taking Twisting Tail games and m- making just Twisting Tail games? Can I expect Oathsworn the Living Card game anytime soon? Uh, well, and, and those other things have miniatures. What is, what does the future look like? Uh, will it be kind of more of the same, just kind of iterating on your, your current thing? Or are you guys, what are your plans loosely? I'm going to let Jamie start that one because if you leave it up to me, I will give you every secret, every plan, <laughs> everything you want to do because it's so exciting and I can't wait to talk okay. about it. But Next interview you... only with Toby. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think um, uh, that we, 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 I mean, we're in the early days, we hashed out a load of ideas. We haven't um, spent massive amounts of time um, working out new ideas since the earlier days because we um we wanted to focus on this game right we want to make sure this game we, we don't want to be thinking dreaming about other other things when we're working on this one and making this as good as it can be um because that you know that would just be dishonorable right like we want to make sure that we're committed to the community and we're making this game um but the but from the earlier days like we've had um there's little, there's other pockets of things like as I said before about like you want to make a game that's actually going to bring something to the market something that's actually going to be something new and enjoyable like it's going to be a it's going to you know you're taking the next step um, and the good thing about games is games are iterating all the time like they're changing and there's there's like you know your people are kind of getting better and better at like encapsulating fun in a box you know and capturing it well um, and so that's from a, from a, the ideas point of view we've got these ideas for a bunch of other games that we'd like to make and they they're not just they're not um, they're not just um, in the O Swarm world, but they're like there are other games that we want to hit the same kind of quality level with, but with other in other areas. So um, uh, you know there, there are, might be card games and there might be you know area control games and you know civilization games and so you know like, there are things all these stuff. I mean I'm I'm an omnivore when it comes to gaming and I I actually like love designing things in all kinds of different spaces and got all these different ideas that are floating around. So I'd love to have the opportunity to spend time designing those and it looks like because it's so wonderful with the community to back the game so well is that it looks like we're going to be able to look into developing those now too um because i mean another reason why you don't want to um to, to spend too much time thinking about other games is, is that if this game didn't go anywhere at all then we definitely wouldn't be able but it would have been designing any of those games so what so why, why why even bother thinking about them too much but yeah no there's definitely a bunch of other games and things we want to do in terms of oath sworn um as toby's saying like this is a um uh, this is kind of like there's a the, 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 you're you're getting to the end of a story, but you're not getting to the end of the world. And so there's um, there's places and things that we wanted to go to. There's even ideas that really in the early phase of development we'd had um, ideas for um, for for content that we just knew we couldn't fit into the box. And there's stories we wanted to tell that we just couldn't do. So there's um there are more stories to tell. Um, that was all dependent on us being able to fund one. So it seems like we're we're funding one. It looks like we're going to be able to 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 dig into that as well because um hopefully like you know when people get the game they're going to enjoy the twisting tales kind of uh, system and that system then can become the backbone of other games um which means we might even be able to turn them out a bit quicker because we have to design the whole system from the ground up for, for future games um but you yeah, know really that's the that the, the heart is to try and make these artisanal games like something that really it's it's focused on user experience it's focused on you know beautiful artwork and minis um and then and then it's capturing something you know it's like capturing a feeling this game was really about capturing combat like it's how does it feel to swing a blade to hit be hit in return to feel under threat like that that's that's what this game's the kind of 
core mechanic thing is about but other games have different mechanics sometimes you know you want to feel like you're you know a general over an army or sometimes you want to feel like you're you know a, yeah, a god in a civ game creating creating a, a world and all this, all this kind of stuff there's there's these different um feelings that you it's like i suppose like appetites isn't it sometimes you want what a meal this sort of meal sometimes you want that sort of meal and so it's, it's going to be the future's going to be focused on like um increasing our recipe um <laughs> our recipe diversity increasing our um uh, menu basically Interesting. Cool. No, that that was a good answer, and uh, you didn't reveal any secrets. It sounds like so. I think you you did good there. <laughs> That's close. Um, so, well, yeah, yeah, you stopped Toby right in time. Um, so uh, the the reason I asked that is because there's kind of two different ways to go about an IP or a board game, and I'm going to talk specifically a Kickstarter. Though Toby, when you mentioned Warhammer Fantasy, it, it kind of aligns with that. There's the kind where you can make a board game and then have 900 percent of the cost of that core game and add-ons and expansions and extras and exclusives and collectibles. And uh, uh, like, I'm, I'm surprised we haven't started making like branding dog leashes for a game and having that as DLC. Um, I mean, it, it just, it, it can get pretty, pretty excessive where you buy the game and it's a hundred dollars or around there and you get, you know, however many plays out of that. And then you times that by like 10 and then that's all the extra content in the exact same universe with pretty much the same mechanics and this is more of the same stuff uh versus one where they're kind of smaller and stuff like that so i'm kind of getting to scope creep here um and kind of tying that into you know you guys did the daily unlocks um but otherwise your add-ons were all finite and set in stone uh could you just talk i guess about your opinions on that when it comes to um you know ha- having a 800 hundred dollar kickstarter campaign versus your guys' much more manageable, smaller one. Was that just because you wanted to get your foot in the door and like that? Or um, it, w- w- was it something else? No, I, th- I think the, um, the the heart is that, I mean, it's a, it's a what I, I think I personally, because I mean, I'm, I'm a board gamer, I'm a backer, I've been doing Kickstarter for 10 years. Like I, 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 I so really when, I, when we came to making this thing, it was like, what does, what would I want to see in a, in, a, in, a, in a campaign, right? And so one of them is like, you don't, um, especially with like gameplay content and stuff like that. Cause, cause ultimately, no matter how many videos you watch, no matter how many things you see, you can't like 100% tell you're going to love this game with all your heart and play it forever. Right. You just can't, you can't tell a thing. So like, like with that in mind, like the idea of adding huge expansions to a game that you, you don't even know yet if you like the first game at that point, like to the point where you don't necessarily want to do expansions. That was the bit that I, I think personally, I don't, I don't feel great, great about like when I'm back here campaign. So, um, so with, so with that, it was, uh, we, we don't want to release game content that like con- new content stuff until people are sure, sure they like the first game, right? As long as they like the first game, then they can decide if they want to play more content. But the idea of, of giving them, cause the thing is, it, it can kind of, it can kind of cash in on the collector's mindset, right? Cause the collector is somebody who looks at it and goes, I would need everything. I just want all of it. Um, and they don't really know if they want all of it really like because they may not ever play those games i mean i i've got i've got expansions and stretch gold things that i've never played on games that i've bought you know and i thought i wanted it but i I never ended up playing it so obviously ultimately i didn't want it because i didn't play it um you know i didn't play with those expansion things that i that i I bought so it's um it's a it's a tough question so that was that was kind of it just not wanting to you know like not really wanting to be evil about (laughs) about the whole thing uh, whatever that looked like um but that doesn't mean that I suppose it's it's when people have had a chance to buy the game and, and they and they, they actually play the game and they sit down and like, OK, I, I like this game. Then to if then people are then honestly saying, I want more of what you've just done. That's when as a company, I feel like you've got, you, you know, you it's then you're, you're actually then you, you should go and make more content because there's people who want it. And they, you know, the community is asking for more. and You don't want to leave people hanging for 10 years on on getting a, getting another another thing. So that was that was part of it. So that's where the gameplay, you know, all the add-ons that we had were all kind of, they're all cosmetic because you kind of, you know what you're getting with a cosmetic thing. Cause it's not, you know, it's not an unknown quantity. You know, you know, in an art book, you're going to get an art book. You're going to see all this lovely artwork and you're going to see, you know, you're going to have some law pieces and you know, you know what it's, what it's going to entail ultimately. Whereas with an expansion perhaps, or with a whole new set of games, you don't necessarily know at that point, you know, at the first, before the games even come out. No, that, that, that it's, 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 you know you see that you see the lot in video games too right where it's a lot of video games companies have almost become predatory with with what they do and how they release games and, and they kind of churn out half designed games and say oh we'll fix it in patches later 
And oh, by the way, here's our season pass for $100. You just shelled out $60 to, to buy the game, and now you, you need a season pass to play the rest of the content. And it just, as a consumer, I, I, I don't like that. And I mean, you know, look, at, look at our game. We started at 15 chapters. We've added really seven when you, when you include the Grove Maiden, but it's really six chapters. Those six chapters add to the content, but they don't, you don't have to play those to get our full story. That full story, the, the, the experience we're trying to give you, we, you know, we weren't going to paywall the rest of the game behind something, right? So we could have taken those 15 stories and made it three different chapters and said, here's our base game. It's chapters one through five. And oh, here's the, the middle section, which is, you know, six, seven, eight, nine, and 10 for another hundred dollars. And here's, you know, 11 through 15 for another hundred dollars. But at the end of the day, would that have given us more backers or more money? I don't think so. I think it would, we would have far fewer backers because it just, it doesn't feel right. We got that whole, our whole approach was about building a community. And it's kind of tough to build a community when you're, you're kind of finding ways to get your hands into their pockets, so to speak, right? It kind of feels disingenuous. Yeah. I, I, I like I like to think on my better days I count as a normal person, um, yeah. <laughs> so, and so like I was thinking if I, what would if you think like what would I like to see from that you know would it you know is is that yeah that you don't want to um you, you know you don't want to give other people something you wouldn't want yourself to to have in that in that situation um yeah I think I think that's 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 part. Of, the, probably just what it was just like just be, you know give to others what you want to have given to yourself right in a campaign and and, and it seems and what's interesting is that of that what's i think that there's i so yeah i would notice i i would notice if a company was doing some of the more nefarious things or perhaps some of the more predatory things that that in it like in a campaign and then often the community will kind of raise, like shout out about it and and and, and, and call bs on something right like so and, and i I think that if you, um, so in that way, like being trying to do something where it's not, it's not too manipulative, right? It's not, you're not trying to make a, make, make people like buy loads of extra stuff or anything like that. People notice that. And actually there's loads of value in that. Like even like just like forgetting morality for it, just actually thinking from a company, like from a public facing company point of view, like people will notice and that hopefully people will gather around you and it, and it feels really, it feels really nice actually. Cause so, you know, it feels, it's, it seems I, I I would attribute at least some of the of what's happened with Oswan with that that kind of that direction. People have been mentioning in the comments like you know we're glad that you know your collector was upfront. You're not releasing anything as we go through the campaign. I know what I'm going to get and where it's going to go, and I'm not going to be sort of slow walked out of my wallet. Um, and and hopefully that you know we remain true to that. So yeah, keep, we're saying this now because we, we want people to keep us on our toes. Because watch out, you know, like I don't want to I don't want to don't want to turn turn evil or something in our, in our later campaign. So keep an eye on us. <laughs> like, well, if, if not, I'll probably mention it um but yeah, uh, no I, I think uh I, I think another big point is just scope creep right i mean you guys had a very big focus on delivering this core nugget and establishing yourselves and then expanding from there because i think a lot of times the all the extras and all the add-ons aren't play tested as well and they just end up you know maybe they break the game a little bit or, or they just don't work as, they don't run as smooth or or stuff like that so i think it's I, I think it's great that you guys are really focused on this core experience and that's it. And then we'll, we'll talk later about, about, about other stuff. Um, yeah. uh, go ahead. I mean, one of the, no, one of the I things, one you. of the, um, uh, things that will probably, it's one of the things, the, the, the things that the reality is about doing it in this way though, is that like, we're not going to start development on that next, like, Oswald game until we're well, well, well done with this one. And we're, you know, so there's, there's going to be a time delay because it took us three years to make where we are now, you know, and that wasn't just because we had a small team. We had a massive team, like, for, for, for like, in, in kind of board game terms for that. So creating games is going to take time because you want to do it well, right? And so it's going to be one of those things where we try and we'll make it as, we'll make things as quickly as we can, but at the same time, we need to, like we we don't want everyone pushing anything out the door that's subpar, um, because the whole you know this whole if we're going for a high a high tier high brand kind of company like you would need to be able to spend that time and and passion over over things. So I don't ever want to get to a point where we're just churning out content because it would be the the capital like the, the, the material thing that was the, like to do it be just the best move for the for the company financially. Um, it's I mean and that's the thing that Toby and I that's why how I knew actually that Toby I I could spend ten years with Toby when we first started out because we were having these conversations and he was like I I 
I, I just want to make something good. Like he was just, he just wanted to make a good game and make it like super high quality. And so every time we ever got to a decision about do we go the high road or the low road, Toby would be the first to say like, let's take the high road. Like let's spend some more money. I don't mind how much it costs us. Let's just get this thing done. We need that person, we need this thing done. And we need to go for that quality because it needs to be awesome. And, um, I, you know, and, I think that's actually part of I me, mean, really a part of your your community, Mike, is part of this thing. Like people who who, who appreciate quality over quantity, yeah. right? They they want something good and they care about the quality because because it ultimately all feeds back into experience. That is people realizing that like aesthetic quality actually feeds back into a a, a, a really nice game, meaty feel to a game, you know. Um, and, and so all these different like these different categories have to be checked off as really high quality. Um, and th- when they all come together, then it makes a really plush experience that people people enjoy. So that's that's always what I, I hope that we always keep that. That's that's you know that it's always about the quality rather than the quantity of stuff we can churn out. Um, really wonderfully though, the kind of level that funding that we've got really it, almost like one of the things that it does is that secures us to be able to do that with our next game because um ultimately you know we've got a lot of money to to give out to the team and to and we've got um you know we've got a lot of expenses still to to go but ultimately between um what toby and i have got is the foot core company we're going to be able to spend time developing the next thing and go on to that other one and so you know we're going to pull that money back into the back into the company and be able to make some new cool stuff hopefully and we'll be able to have this conversation again in a couple of years or whatever with a new thing that we've been we had to spend time on yeah, no, that makes sense. We, so we can say that we're not. We won't say what it is, but we can say we know what the next game is that we release. Toby, Toby. Okay. I'm not going to say what no, no, it no, is, that, but that, that, I can say that we've chosen what it's going to be. You to, you to my it yeah. I'll, I'll edit it later. Don't worry about it. Toby will just have no voice in the entire entire interview. Uh, no, I actually, I, I think that's that's fine for a. It makes sense for a company to have at least some high level plan. Like that's, I, I, I get that. Um, you, you know, Jamie, you kind of mentioned the the quality over quantity and uh, why that's so important to me. And just as from a consumer point of view is that, um, you know, I'm going to be spend, I'm going to have my friends over and I'm going to be spending an entire afternoon using this. And I have, I can pick one to do that with. And so if I'm just picking one, I'm going to pick the best of the best, right? The, the 10 out of the 10, even a nine out of 10, it, it's not going to get to the table. If I have a 10 out of 10, I can play. Uh, and so keeping that quality up just from a consumer point, is is big but then you talked about you guys have been working on this for for you know three three plus years now you definitely want to work on something that's quality so i think that makes a lot of sense i'm I'm really glad you guys have that passion uh so that's it as far as uh questions so toby almost made it to the end without without uh <laughs> <laughs> you know outbursts no uh but uh, really guys thank you for the time i really appreciate it and i'm so glad you guys are are uh reaping the rewards of uh, all the hard work and stuff that you guys have put into this um yeah, so- well, thank you Go ahead. And like to say, I'd like to say just like to have, because I, I, I'm sure that like a good portion of the people who go watch this are people who back the game. And, um, we just want to say thank you to everybody. Like, but like, I, it's, we could, we can't go like man to man, woman to woman, talk, man to woman talking, saying thank you to everybody. I'd love to shake all your hands, but thank you so much for backing us. And just know like we are working hammer and tongues all, 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 all hammer and tongues all, all day, all night trying to get this thing made and, and, and make it as good a quality as we can. So, um, as far as it is possible for us to, to, to make this game good, it's going to be good for you. Right. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. And- yeah, that and and we're we're proud of the community that's assembling around us and in, in the game, the Ellis Warren, and that catering to that community, reaching out to that community, and fostering that not just the goodwill, but fostering the creativity in that community is is kind of at the forefront of our not just finishing the development of the game and make sure it's manufactured correctly and it's on your table on time, but cultivating that relationship with the community that one that one-on-one relationship with the community is you know our, our number one priority so there'll be a lot more stuff coming like jamie said with even post campaign um uh, contests and things like that uh, that we want just to to reach out and always have our our um have a presence within the community so that you know that we're always listening we always want that feedback sure no perfect yeah and, and, and if for whatever reason somebody watching this hasn't backed yet or hasn't looked into it. There is a link in the description below to your guys' Kickstarter. Check it out for sure. Uh, def- definitely worthwhile. You, you guys are a great bunch. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think everybody appreciates the passion you guys bring. Thanks, Mike. And we can't thank you enough for, for everything that, that you've done to help us to, to be where, where we are. And it's, you know, it's you and there's a couple other folks that we've worked with too to, to get here, but it's, Without your help, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we're at right now. Oh, well, it was definitely my, pre- my, my pleasure. Yeah, I believe in what you guys are doing, and I'm, I'm, I'm really happy for it. 
All right, guys. So that's it for the interview. Uh, you know, feel free to you know subscribe and do all that. But for the most part, I just wanted to put this out here, remind everybody that the Kickstarter is closing, and that uh, you should check it out if you haven't yet or you've been holding off on it. They've done a lot of unlocks. All right, talk to you soon. All right, I'm back. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I know I did. Thank you so much, Jamie and Toby, for doing that. You guys rock. Not everybody would be willing to sit down with me, first of all, because who knows what I'm going to ask. But second of all, just give an hour plus of your time for the community to just be there to answer questions and stuff. We kind of mentioned it in the interview how you guys want to be there and be involved, especially during the campaign. And I think that's really, really important. Again, not every developer would have sat down for an hour and done this with me. And so I'm really glad that you guys were able to because I think it's uh, it's great for people to hear kind of your thoughts on things and uh, uh, just kind of see you present in any form. So uh, thanks for that, guys. Toby, get some sleep. I know you've been sculpting for like a bajillion hours, so I hope you did that. And uh, congrats on the successful campaign. I think you guys did a great job. All right, guys, that's all I have. Have a great day. I'll talk to you soon.